So my name is Susanna Eckersley. I'm a senior lecturer in Museum Gallery and Heritage Studies at Newcastle University in the UK. Um, and I'm an associated researcher at the um, Centre for Contemporary Historical Research in Potsdam in Germany as well. Um, and yeah, Susie and I are really pleased to have everybody here, um, all our panellists and uh, those of you coming to listen and hopefully engage in discussion and questions we'd really like um, as interactive as possible a session. So please don't feel shy to speak up and feel free to post in the chat. If you prefer to write your question rather than speak it, you're very welcome to do that. Um, and as Susie said, please raise your hand if you, um, you know, if you want to pose a question verbally. Um, yep. So yes, we'll just go ahead. Um, one of our panellists, I believe, I'm just checking the list, is not here yet. So I'm just going to send her an email. Oh, okay, you, great. I think. But um, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll hopefully they will turn up though. Um, so yeah, so to begin with, before we get into the discussion, um, we have invited each of the panellists to introduce themselves uh, by telling a little bit about their involvement and interest in this topic, and, and also if they wish to offer a short provocation, which we may come back to later on. Um, so in no particular order, and bearing in mind that somebody hasn't, uh, isn't here quite just yet, um, we've also... Uh, invited panellists from, from um, uh, the CF disciplines, but also the related ones. Um, I'd like to give the screen, first of all, for introduction to Kirsti, if you'd like to go first, please. Thank you very much, Susie and Susanna, for organising this. And um, I would like to say that the first session was really interesting one, and I liked all the papers, and there were many, many things to, to take with me and thought... Uh, further on that issue, and I hope we can also discuss a little bit the papers, which <laughs> were very interesting. So, but I wanted to start with the um, um, question that how we understand difficult heritage, which probably is also in the different regions in Europe, is understood uh, differently, as we also saw in the first part. And uh, um, as uh, um, I'm speaking from Estonia and uh, speaking about the Estonian and Baltic cases. Then here in this context, uh, uh, the legacy of Second World War uh, occupations, especially the Soviet occupation, the war itself, Holocaust and deportations, Gulag experiences. This is the what, what makes the core of difficult heritage also today. Um, of course, the divergent groups have experienced those events on their own way, and most importantly, every individual has its own experiences and relations to those events. But nevertheless, significant role plays also whose memory is cherished at public memory institutions, like the museums, and who's not. So co currently, actually, the main community I'm working or I'm researching and I'm, I really hope that it will be a working together, actually, I'm coming to that, back is actually the community of museum curators and managers. Uh, and with our team here at the Department of Ethnology at University of Tartu, we are looking how this heritage of 20th century is collected and mediated at Baltic Culture History Museums. So, uh, and uh, what is the role of curators, museum curators there, what they choose to collect, what they choose to, to uh, display on the exhibitions. But so far, unfortunately, we have still worked only on the Estonian museums because, um, because of the pandemic, uh, we were not able to, to visit uh, and make fieldwork in Lithuania and Latvia, but hopefully in autumn, we can do that. And I wanted to bring in also the case of privately owned mu museum in Estonia, of Museum of Occupations and Freedom, which I have been uh, studying since 2016 together with Vena Gurasar. So we have done interviews with different museum curators and managers and participated also in different events there, besides, of course, analyzing the exhibitions. So I want to show and uh, very shortly uh, how the how one community during the lifetime of the one museum, which is a quite new museum, uh, how this one community have been empowered and disempowered uh, during the restructuring of the museum. So how the role of one community could change if the museum itself is repositioning itself. So this museum opened in 2003 and the first expo was dedicated mainly to the victims of uh, Stalinism. The victims of Nazis, Holocaust, however, were represented at only at margins. 
but the community of deported repressed people and the Soviet regime considered the museum as a memorial and sacred place. So they, they saw themselves as keeper of this difficult heritage and also just reclaimed ownership also to the museum. Um, this is that there was no central memorial was uh, erected in, in Thailand at that time. So they, they considered this, this museum as, as, as also a stay place. So also the first leadership and also the, some of the museum curators were connected directly to that community of repressed people. So the first manager being former prisoner of consciousness. So it was also in, in this uh, aspect, very clearly participatory approach from the museum side. So, but of course, um, this approach excluded also other communities, actually other communities who also experienced Soviet area and especially the Soviet era newcomers were excluded. So in 2015, with the new management and board, the museum started to democratize the museum and to renew its content. So uh, the aim of the new leadership uh, from the younger generation who were very well transnationally connected and educated uh, was to include other communities to attract mainly younger audience and also Russian speakers of Estonia. And the aim was also to re renew the exhibition, which was museologically really outdated and was also uh, criticized ideologically from uh, by the side of researchers from local ones and also by uh, uh, international ones. That was also one point. So, but the rebranding started with the name change, dropping the name of occupation uh, from its name and underlying the freedom in its name. So the community of uh, repressed people felt offended and excluded from the renewing process. However, the, the actual exhibition when opened in 2018 deals uh, still with traumas of World War II on the topic of inhumanity. So the experiences are included to that exhibition, but during this debate, they felt that they are actually excluded. Uh, and uh, as a result of this uh, debate, which were taking place for a couple of months, actually the museum uh, also keep the name of occupation in the name um, for the sake actually that particular community. But now we can say that uh, the new exhibition is open now uh, for three years and the museum in the everyday activities is still using the more the name of Babamu, which is the short version of the Museum of Freedom. So, and also in the everyday activities, this specific community is not included anymore. So it's, they are more working with the younger generation and they are more interested in the question of um, freedom of uh, speech, uh, the question of democracy, and there are not so many activities involved uh, to do with the, that particular community. Still, it doesn't mean that they are excluded totally in this sense that the museum still is uh, collecting the objects and collecting their stories also. But I just wanted to bring in this example to show how uh, yeah. during actually the very short time period, uh, the role of one community could change. So, and the other point I wanted to make is this, uh, but I can came, come it back also, or how much time do I have? <laughs> yeah, we, we should try and keep fairly brief on this. So if it's possible to come back, that would be excellent. Yeah, Thank you. The, the role of researchers and curators to work together. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, and thank you for, for being here with us today. Um, could I ask Ulla to go next with a short intro and publication? Yes, yeah, sure. And and um, also, I want to thank Susie and Susanna for inviting me. And 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 the first first part of this session was really really inspiring and and very interesting uh, papers. So thanks thanks for those papers as well. And so so my name is Ulla Savolainen, and I work as a university researcher at the University of Helsinki in the Department of Cultures. So I'm a, a folklorist specializing in memory studies, oral history, life writing and narrative research. But lately I have also moved toward exploring issues related to hereditization of memories. And my own research has related to memories and memory, re memory related to various minority groups or minoritized groups. 
So my PhD dissertation explored life writings of former Finnish Karelian evacuees related to their childhood experiences of evacuation journey and losing their homes. And these writings were produced in the context of the collection campaign by the folklore archives of the Finnish Literature Society. And after that, I conducted an oral history research on the internment of German and Hungarian citizens in Finland in 1944 and 6, and analyzed the reception of compensation law related to this internment. And currently, I'm researching both personal and collective or public remembrances related to the history of the group called Ingrian Finns. For example, related to their experiences of Soviet repression and various forced mobilities during the 20th century. And moreover, I'm interested in issues related to heritization of these memories through the recent activities of, for example, the archives of the Finnish Literature Society and the Nas National Museum of Finland. So, in Finland, the archives of the Finnish Literature Society, for example, has been one of the key institutional actors in collect collection and heritization of folklore and later written reminiscences and oral histories. Although these kinds of collecting activities today aims at inclusivity and, and can even perhaps be considered as participatory, at least in some cases, it is obvious that not all groups, communities and pasts are involved. The collecting of folklore or memories and who can take part in these processes are, in other, other words, always highly selective processes. The mere fact that these kinds of collecti collecting activities originally went hand in hand with nation building has made certain groups or communities and their heritages, folklore and memories more relevant and appealing from the perspective of the collectors and researchers than of the others. Also today, processes of collection and research are not value free. Instead, various ideologies have an effect on which and whose pasts, experiences and perspectives are perceived worth of collecting, archiving and analyzing. Various values and ideologies also affect which kind of communities are involved in these processes. So, for example, currently a strong focus on difficult, especially traumatic and violent memories and value given to these is reflected in research, collecting and museum practice alike. Difficult pasts may also be the ones that communities themselves want to heritage and highlight. So, in this starting statement, I would like to argue that as researchers and professionals, we need to analyze also critically our preoccupation with difficult memories and ask what are the possible pitfalls related to the cultural emphasis placed on difficult heritages, memories and pasts. So, thank you. This was my, my um, um, statement for now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, we'll continue with the introductions. Uh, perhaps Gabe, you'd be willing to go next. Sure. Um, can you hear me all right? Great. Yes. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Gabe Mashenska. I'm a Associate Professor in Public Archaeology at UCL in London. Um, and I work across a number of memory and heritage related fields. Um, well, one of the areas I've, I've worked in a lot is a, a, a conflict heritage, looking particularly at the experience of, of children in conflict environments and the way childhood memories of conflict are mediated through artefacts and landscapes and materiality in, in general. Um, I have an intellectual and political interest in marginalized heritage in the heritage of um, extremely marginalized um, communities. Well, one of the things that I worked on recently, which has really brought a lot of these issues that we're looking at today into focus, um, was trying to un understand an archaeological assemblage of um, heroin injecting material and um, needles, syringes, spoons, and heroin, which I um, discovered in a family member's a garden. 
Um, and I wanted to, 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 to try to understand this assemblage archaeologically rather than just seeing it as something um, scary. Because my, 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 my instinct is this is something scary in terms of a crime, scary in terms of the physical harm of dirty needles and things. Um, so m m part of my our our challenge in, in approaching this material as heritage was to overcome my own um, prejudices. Um, in working on, on, on this material and trying to better understand the contemporary archaeology and heritage of people who inject of drugs, I worked with members of uh, a drug user advocacy communities focus on, who focus on human rights of drug users. And I, I would say in the UK and many, 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 many other countries as well, people who inject uh, of drugs are one of the most socially marginalised uh, communities. Um, it was interesting to me to encounter the way in which these um, this community organises the way this the way this community organises to advocate for their rights, their legal rights, health rights, and so on, and human rights overall. Um, and it's interesting as well to think of it in terms of civil society as a whole. And I think this is something important for those of us to think about who work in universities, museums, other sort of heritage organisations. We are part of civil society. We have powerful roles in shaping the way that civil society um, um, deals with heritage, deals with marginalised heritage. We are shaping arguments in ways we may not always realise. Um, so what I, I was quite surprised by was the extremely negative reaction to my work and to the fact that I was working with a drug users civil society organisations um, from a number of colleagues who I think, who I thought of and who would think of, of them themselves as well as politically radical or politically leftist, at least, um, who could not um, overcome their own prejudices and, and their own, if I'm being very, very honest, their own personal traumas and experiences of people who use drugs and, and drugs as a whole, um, which is an entirely reasonable thing. But it was interesting to see people struggle to um, intellectualize these things, struggle to overcome and fail to overcome their prejudices. And I think this is something all of us in academia, museums, and these sort of elite civil society organizations need to be more aware of, of the limits of our own tolerance, the limits of our own liberalism, and to be critical and are self-aware and self-critical when we're engaging in this work because we have the potential to do a great deal of good within civil society discussion. We also, we also have a great deal of ability to, to do harm if we do it wrong. So I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I apologize if Susie and I have looked a little distracted. We're trying to let our fifth panellist into the, the room and she's having some difficulties. So um, nearly there. Yes. But apologies for um, us looking like we weren't. Uh, thank you so much to all of you um, um, for those. Susie, did you we want have to? some more intros? We have Roma still. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> But yeah, we were listening, but also distracted with uh, many devices trying to fix uh, what was going on. So yes, um, thank you, Gabe, for that. Another provocative statement and really interesting perspectives. Roma, could uh, the screen is yours if you'd like to introduce yourself. Thank you. So let me be very brief since we are waiting for another presentation. I'm Roma Sendik. I'm uh, speaking from Krakow, Poland, Jagiellonian University, I'm teaching at the Polish Studies Department and I'm a head of the Research Center for Memory Cultures. And this is basically my uh, first and foremost engagement. I am I'm working as a Holocaust scholars, uh, scholar and memory scholar and I uh, have recently uh, cooperated with ethnographers for a longer period of time working on a project uh, and curating a, an exhibition on folk art presenting Holocaust. Uh, so uh, in my mind, 
uh, genocide is ex exactly the topic that that leaves such traces that that can be considered the ultimate form of difficult heritage. Uh, not the only one, of course, but closer look at, at Holocaust aftermath, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, reveal, reveals this multiple forms of engagement with post-genocidal uh, legacy. Uh, I'm using this term uh, to diverse, to, 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 to make the, the vocabulary a little bit more diverse, to, to think about different forms of engagement with difficult uh, heritage. Uh, which uh, can be uh, our voluntarily accepted inheritance or part, part of involuntarily being involuntarily thrown into a situation that we have absolutely no control over. So um, the Central Eastern Europe uh, opens up question of objects that have been left after, after genocide, after the Holocaust, after different ethnic cleansing and been reappropriated, looted uh, by other communities. So uh, apart of the, those obvious questions, there are new questions arising uh, within the discourse of Holocaust studies. I would gladly discuss with you, especially in relation to Pilar's text uh, from the previous session. And I think how, uh, heritage scholars could help us to clear the new situation because after natural, uh, after uh, forensic turn, eco turn, and material turn, we have in Holocaust studies, we have to consider completely different subjects like objects, dead bodies, plants as being partners in discussion on heritage, which is clearly depicted uh, nowadays in Krakow in the heated discussion over the former concentration camp site. Kael Plashov and what to do with it and who is actually a partner in this discussion. So uh, with these new necro eco communities, how to come to terms in how to build this new particip participatory culture with those new subjects is an open question. I hope we could at some point engage in our discussion uh, with, this, with this issue. Thank you. Sorry, just to meet myself. Thank you very much for that. Um, and, and welcome again. Thank you for joining. Um, so, yes, if Benjamini, you would like to introduce yourself. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, and apologies to all of you for joining late. I just made it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Benjamina Efodazi, and I'm a collections uh, assistant uh, in anthropology at the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology uh, at the University of Cambridge. Uh, I'm also the digital editor for uh, the Open uh, Access Resource and Publication Project, uh, 100 Histories. Um, and uh, in my work, uh, I love the, of the focus, and I think uh, its relevance to this, uh, this uh, panel, uh, is thinking through the role of, uh, of objects in uh, in museum and the value we can we can find in them uh, in the present time, uh, especially when we are looking at objects that emerge from uh, colonial contexts. Um, what do we make of those? And, and also the the role of uh, the diaspora in the in the making uh, and the narration and the curation of uh, of these objects. Um, working here at the museum. Um, I've engaged um, with the idea of who get, gets to curate um, these histories, which communities, uh, you know, get to to be the sort of the representative of a, of a, of the wider community. So, for example, you know, I am a Can, but within the Akan uh, linguistic group, we have multiple uh, sort of uh, groups. Uh, we have the Fantu, we have the Asante, we have uh, the Dentra. Uh, and so the question is, for example, if you are curating uh, material culture from uh, the Akan people, which one of these groups get to be the voice of the, of, of the group? Um, so for example, the Asante historically have had a very loud voice in this conversation uh, because of their material wealth in the form of gold. Uh, and so in this sense, uh, what is the role of the of the curator uh, in um, sort of uh, creating narratives that reflect uh, uh, the wider community from which these objects come from? Um, and so, yeah, so these are some of the things I've, I've spent time thinking about uh, also in my own uh, doctoral research. Um, and I'm looking forward to 
uh, speaking more with uh, all of you and also, you know, through audience questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so as we said at the beginning here, um, please join in uh, with chat and with, with raise hand if you want to uh, contribute. Um, we'll, we'll kick off with, with the questions now and I'll hand over to Susanna in a second. But again, just for sort of easy housekeeping, also the panelists, if you wish to respond to a particular question, please use a raise hand so that we can keep an eye on sort of who's next and that kind of thing. So over to you, Susanna. I quite like that we're Susie and Susanna. I feel like we should have a TV show after this. Anyway. Great. Thank you. So our starting question was really to try and um, think and provoke the question of what are the rules at the moment? And of course, you're all in very different fields and giving very different examples in your work. But I wondered if you could reflect on, I suppose, the power relations in who creates those rules and how do you use rules within your work or your research, um, but also how might you use them productively or how might you subvert those rules? And is perhaps subversion of the rules an expected um, activity within your your work in relation to heritage and difficult heritage and communities. So this was a question, an open question, really, to any of the panelists who would like to think through some of these bigger questions. Um, you know, are the rules are the rules there on purpose? Are the rules made to be broken, or are the rules there for other reasons? And how do you work within and without the rules? Okay, Gabe, you want to kick off? Sure. I, I was just going to say that I think a lot of the th things we think of as rules are rules uh, specific to individual disciplines. Um, and I think part of what makes the sort of work we we're talking about, about here quite interesting is that it falls be in between disciplines quite a lot, or it, or it blends disciplines. So there are things that I, that I see people do in, and, and call archaeology of the modern world that would be unacceptable as material culture anthropology, unethical as museum work, appallingly bad as oral history but somehow these these it falls in, in between these things and i'm sure that there are there are other things that work in other ways as well so I, I think we need to think about exactly this about work which falls between disciplines falls outside of of these norms and look at the way perhaps these new rules and new methods sort of emerge organically and having said that i can't think of any examples so i'll stop talking Thank you. It is quite a challenging question, but you're you're very much. Um, I think we very much, Susie and I, probably very much agree with you that it is. Um, you know, one of the purposes of this panel was to think through and against these disciplinary boundaries and to see how you know how they might work together productively, how we might um, you know engage in the spaces between the disciplines and thinking about new ways of doing and thinking um, work, particularly in relation to difficult heritage or um, hard to reach communities or communities who are themselves difficult to work with um, in all sorts of ways, particularly if we think back to some of the session, uh, session this earlier today around um, far right uh, participants in research and, and this kind of, of issue. Um, so uh, I just wanted to uh, reflect on the uh, on the question you asked, Susanna, about um, um, the rules. And so, for example, one, one one thing that comes to mind is when we are working with communities, um, we invite communities into the museum space uh, and sort of have this expectation of you know uh, communities coming in and sort of sharing their their knowledge with us. Um, oftentimes, forgetting that the power uh, that museums and curators have in this uh, in this space. Um, what if uh, we were to go to the community um, and engage uh, with the community in their own space where they have their own power? Um, and, and 
you know, also taking, so talking specifically about objects, uh, taking the objects outside of the museum space, um, instead of this sort of um, attachment, uh, visceral attachment to, to the space of, of, the, of the museum. So that's one of the things I uh, oftentimes think about. Yep, um, Roma, would you like to respond or add? So uh, perhaps a small addition on how um, so how we see uh, from uh, how I see from the research we currently finished uh, researching uncommemorated sites of mass graves in the Polish countryside. How do we see their rules? And uh, well, definitely there's a set of rules that is legal, moral, ethical, religious, and that that is, that is easy to decipher. Uh, because it's historical, it's written, it's institutionalized. But there is a set of rules extremely difficult to work when you work with difficult heritage. It's it's a set of unwritten rules uh, obeyed uh, by the community. And the, the extreme difficulty for us as researchers, I mean, the research center I'm part of, was that these rules are uh, voiced and communicated and passed down through generations in such a way that a researcher has had extreme difficulties to pin them down because they are not voiced. They are passed through negative form of communication, through gestures, suggestions, uh, silences. So it's uh, for someone who's coming to such a community, it's trying to research this community, these negative set of communication rules is so difficult to grasp and oral history cannot help us. Uh, ethnography is better in helping researchers in Holocaust studies and memory studies and supporting, finding out the, 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 the communicated past uh, in uh, communicating in this negative way. Uh, but I would like to mention uh, one broker, uh, one important broker of these uh, rules, of someone who's breaking the rules. So there's usually in the community someone who is uh, a dissident, someone who's not ag ag agreeing to the overall silence or overall uh, situation of, of consensus over not speaking or not tackling something difficult. So it's extremely important to also perhaps uh, there, is, there will be an occasion in this panel to discuss how a researcher, a curator, um, a, a museum scholar could support such a broker in the countryside, in the field, somewhere in the in the area we research that is definitely uh, standing against and usually extremely lonely uh, against its own community, supporting the, the case of difficult heritage. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a really important point that actually some of these rules are unspoken rules. We, we maybe are going in blind a lot of the time. I think that's a really important point. Um, Ulla, would you like to? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, really interesting point. Uh, I uh, I thought to reflect a bit uh, from the perspective of, of my work, which is basically like memory studies and, and oral history research and, and research of, of life writings and these vernacular remembrances. Um, I think especially in the field of oral history research, uh, there has been a, a strong emphasis that the researcher um, is kind of also really active uh, participant in, in collecting oral histories and sort of uh, bringing the voice of, of, of people or, or the informants um, into our books and, and kind of um, uh, giving voice to, to them. And, and um, nowadays, especially when uh, there are new forms of uh, uh, communicating and uh, mediating memories, for example, new social media platforms and, and etc. Um, uh, communities and, and people have uh, kind of a new uh, new channels and new media for creating their own kind of um, places of remembrance and their own 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 spaces where they can um, kind of collect memories and 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 share memories and and sometimes. Um, uh, it might be that those people uh, whose uh, memories we are as researchers interested in, they don't really need us to, to collect their memories or, or kind of um, be the transmitters or mediators or, or of their experiences. 
but instead they might want to do it themselves. So, so also <clears throat> the people and communities um, whose memories we are interested in, they might create their own rules that, uh, and, and we as researchers may sometimes have to just accept these and, and kind of rethink that what is our position. And I think that this kind of reflection also, um, it's it's something that um, oral historians have to do and, and some, of course, have done it. But yeah, but this, is, this is something that I have been thinking. And so I think, yeah, Kirsty and... Gabe have their hands. Um, maybe Kirsty goes first and then Gabe. Yeah, thank you. Oh, okay. I hope that's the right order, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, I just uh, was also thinking about this question and uh, I think maybe my position is a little bit different as I'm really now working with them, uh, hopefully working together with museum curators also. And there is also this question who is... Um, who is actually making the exhibition? I mean, who is behind that? And a couple of weeks ago, we had an, um, a research seminar, a seminar on the hybrid format. And then we had Liliana Radonic there, who have studied a lot of uh, Eastern and Central European museums. And then the, she brought uh, in the idea that actually we as researchers, um, we have the duty to share our best practices to the museum curators also, or at least um, she assured that she's doing that. But um, at the same time, I was thinking that it is a quite a difficult position, actually, because an, um, a museum exhibition is a, such a kind of complex issue that actually I think that um, who is making rules there is more the, the museum curators than we as a researchers. But of course, there is the, this role of us as a researchers to, um, to maybe to, to offer <laughs> what we know and to help uh, to do better the things. But uh, I mean, also this issue of as, uh, what Ulla pointed out, out that we really have to be also self-reflective when uh, offering uh, something to the communities. Thank you. Thank you. And Gabe. Thanks. I wanted to pick up on this um, this issue of um, small communities and people in, the, in those communities whose narratives are at variance with the majority and the idea that we can work with those people and, we, and they deserve our support in some way. I have done um, memory work in conflict environments in small communities and i'm always impressed with the agency of people in these communities they do not tend to need reaching out to and supporting if, if, if they spot something like a, a, a researcher from another country who's there in the community and they, they they immediately think how can i exploit this with my relationship with this person in order to promote my narratives um and i'm not saying that in a nasty way but this is the reality of it and these people us are intelligent they have agency and the dynamics of memory narratives in small communities particularly around conflict particularly around um, heritage which is not talked about is incredibly dangerous incredibly risky so just the presence of an, of an external person there can be extremely destabilizing of these relationships now there's power in being able to, to destabilize these things and hopefully the, in a perfect world uh, provide a platform for people who've been marginalized. There's also a great risk of the researcher being exploited um, and used probably by the dominant um, forces for their interest there. I mean, I've had interesting experiences walking around a village talking about conflict history. And this is a conflict uh, outside of living memory and yet the person showing me around would not point at, at specific buildings or places because he knew if he pointed at them people would know what we were talking about so it was a very strange walking through an apparently abandoned town but still being scared of the people looking through cracks in the curtains 
to see what we're up to. So I, th I think, yeah, we, would, um, we should respect the agency of the people we're working with, also be suspicious of everything because it's very easy to be, um, yeah, used. Okay, thank you. And I think Ola would like to respond to that and, and then we'll continue a little bit with a few more questions. But Ola, please. Yes, uh, I, I totally agree with you. And, and, and related to that, I also think that um, we have to really like, um, as it has been discussed many times during this session, that, that uh, we have to think that what is community and kind of a uh, be aware of not essentializing communities or romanticizing communities because um, communities um, might not be like one community. There, there might be various voices and, and kind of a power struggles inside the community. And, and we as researchers have to be kind of also um, know the situation and not ended up like uh, romanticizing or essentializing these communities as we know that <laughs> community of researcher is not like a unanimous community, but there are several voices and several struggles and several various opinions. And, and as, as Gabriel said, uh, we are in a position of authority uh, and, and what we do and, and whose voice we are lifting up, it, it might have an effect on the community and, and the kind of their internal power relations or discussions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, and that leads actually quite neatly in some of the points you've, you've all made already to the next um, sort of question cluster, um, which was to, to ask about the communities that you, you work with. And, and you've all sort of mentioned this at least, at least a little bit already in your introductions, but you can sort of come back to this now and, and think a little bit more and reflect a bit more on, on that and, and who actually represents those communities and I think it does tie in a lot actually with what um, several of you have said already about about who you listen to and, and how they respond um, to to the researcher and and so related to thinking about who gets to represent those communities um, the question really and this also reflects a little um, Benjamina touched upon this already about how material from these communities is treated so how is um, material from source communities and others treated and, and interpreted, curated by museums and researchers? Uh, and what are the challenges there? What have you come across as challenges? Um, well, let me let me kick that off then. <laughs> um, I mean, it's it's difficult, and I think part of part of the curation process is to make these difficulties and these challenges known, like to present them to the audience uh, and not to sort of attempt to sanitize um, the source community or attempt to present a, a homogeneous narrative that does not exist. Uh, so for example, um, we, we are actually opening an exhibition uh, tomorrow um, on, um, on the work of, um, of an anthropologist uh, from the early 1900s uh, called Notcott Thomas. Uh, some of the collections he uh, gathered um, during um, his work in Sierra Leone and Nigeria um, as part of the colonial office um, uh, employment he had uh, in 1909. Um, and there are some, for example, there are some images in the in the exhibition um, that um, you know um, some of, of nudity and and others uh, that we spent uh, we have spent some time thinking about whether to use those images or not um, um, because um, you know in the sort of in context those images are fine um, because you know so for example talking about uh, an image of a child with uh with beads uh, and that's all that child in context is dressed uh, but in the context for example of the uk uh that may be a contentious um uh, the contentious and how do you treat that um how do you present that to the public uh who's so and if you are consulting the community are you consultants of the elders are you consulting uh younger people are you consulting the diaspora, you consulting the people back at home. 
Um, and if you think about the context of where I am, so for example, in Cambridge, um, you know, if you think about, for example, school children coming in to see this exhibition and imagine a, a black child seeing this image, uh, right? What might be their reaction? And so there are all these things that need to be thought about. Um, and, you know, there isn't a self straightforward answer. Um, but the point is, are you able to provide the perspective from which you are operating and the, the information that, uh, that informed your knowledge to present uh, such, uh, such images or such uh, items? Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's something <laughs> I've been thinking about, I've had to think about the last few months. Um, yeah. That does sound incredibly challenging. I mean, how, how, how do you make decisions in the end with that? I and mean, it sounds like there's been so many dilemmas there. Do you sort of just have to make a decision and, and go with it or? Yeah, so effectively that's what we have done. Uh, we, have, we, have retained the, we have retained the image uh, as uh, initially uh, thought out uh, because in context that um, the, the child is dressed and I think for us, um, we are in the position to explain the sort of mm -hmm. thinking process that led us to that choice. Yeah. Um, and if that thinking process changes, our action, of course, would change as well. Um, and so that's why I'm saying that it's important not to sort of, so based also on, on Ula's point, you know, not to, you know, create a homogeneous entity of community, um, and also not to sort of um, present our choices as though they are the only choice um, because there are, different, there are different ways of seeing. And I think it's important to present those different ways of seeing. Yeah. Oh, am I muted? No, I'm not muted. Sorry, I'm losing track of all my screens. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, really good points. Um, Gabe, I think you've got your hand up. Yeah, it's just, just a follow-up question for Benjamina, really, because, I mean, and it's a bit unfair because it's, it's a quick question for anyone, really, but because of what Benjamina was talking about. Um, how would you deal with a situation where you, you, you're consulting with different elements of, 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 a, of a community, as you say, diaspora community, young people, older people, and you get opposing advice? Um, how do you negotiate those kinds of situations? Yeah, so that that's difficult, and I'm glad I'm not a curator. <laughs> <laughs> so I wouldn't necessarily make that decision, but I think um, part of that process again is um, being able to present those conflicts, because I mean, visitors are smart. You know, visitors don't expect us to sort of spoon feed them uh, narratives that. Um, that are sort of sanitized, that are sort of perfect and are ready, sort of ready meals, right? We can, we can offer ingredients, okay? We can offer ingredients for, for visitors to make their own meal um, because I think it's important for, for everyone to engage in the difficulty of, of, of presenting the past or, or bringing the past into the present, um, you know, um, there are people who have had difficult encounters with their own histories uh, back at home. So, you know, in this, in this situation, like for example, in Nigeria. Um, and, and so they don't necessarily remember things in a, they remember things differently from, um, from others. Uh, and I think it is fair and it is, um, it is, just for us to present those different points of view. Uh, and this is not to say that we have to create a sort of a, a false equivalence um, when presenting narratives, um, but, you know, presenting motivations, why people want to engage with specific uh, items, why they don't want to engage with specific items, and 
what is our rationale for presenting uh, the narrative that we are presenting. Thank you. I think um, there's some really, really interesting and quite kind of complex things going on there that I ha- In my mind, they relate to issues that all of the panellists have brought up in different ways. So I just wanted to kind of try and pick out a little bit more of that. Um, In terms of thinking about, um, Benjamina, what you were saying, but also I'm thinking here around, um, Gabe, what you were saying about um, the power relationships internally within some of the kind of communities or um, groups of people that... um, each of you in your research is working with, um, you know, particularly around those people who perhaps don't put themselves forward to be engaged with or don't volunteer to to share their story, the people who are perhaps a little more reluctant um, to tell the story for all sorts of reasons, whether it's around a power dynamic or just around um, the marginalisation of the issue that's being discussed or in relation to the objects, you know, I think, Gabe, you were talking about having found um, objects related to um, drug use and how the stories of that and the material culture of that is quite difficult to kind of to get to the bottom of. Um, So I was thinking about um, the different kind of ethical challenges that each of you faces in your own way, in your work, with this kind of how how you draw out or how you present these complex um, nuances in whose stories or whose perspectives are being kind of given value over others in relation to objects or in relation to the telling of stories or the exhibiting of um, pasts and presents, but also around um, when you're thinking about your own role or the role of museum curators or heritage professionals or researchers is whether you see um, see that as a kind of um, in relationship to activism of any sort or, a, you know, taking a particular standpoint and what the kind of ethics and balances are um, within that. Again, I realise quite complex um, question, but it would be really interesting to hear um, each of you if, you, if you want to, to respond to some of those difficult complexities within your work. I don't know who would like to go first. I, I could I could be like the uh, school teacher and pick on someone, but uh, welcome. Yeah. Here I, I was going to say too, if, if anybody from the previous session also wishes to type in chat, comment or, or add on this, I think this is probably challenges uh, we've all been dealing with in different ways. I'm happy to talk if no one else wants to, but I realise I've been, an animal as well, so you I've been talking quite a lot, so I'd, I'd rather hand over to, to someone else if, if there was anyone else who would rather take this. Um, if not, then just yeah, um, thank you for for raising that issue of working with my marginalised communities, particularly the, uh, the community of of drug users who, who, who I was mentioned earlier, because that, that's an interesting example, picking up on what what we were saying just now about of communities of um there is a powerful activist community advocating for human rights of people who use drugs but it is noticeable in this situation and in other situations like disability rights um sex worker rights that the people who become community representatives are often those who are most elite eloquent white um educated so I think there's a risk as well if we work with a self-declared or self-constructed community activists. There's a risk that we are not dealing with people who are fully representative of the communities they claim to represent. Or equally, that is not a decision for a person to make externally. You know, you can't say to someone, you're not really the representative of who you say you are because who the hell are, are, are we to make that choice on their behalf? It's a very complicated situation and it raises absolute ethical issues of, of um, informants, uh, choosing informants, um, who we choose to work, work with and how. And that was exactly this situation that I, I experienced looking to work with our drug user activists. 
the, the person who I ended up working mostly with was someone with an academic background because, because he was m- most familiar with the f- frameworks of ethics and um, the type of, 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 of research I, I was working in. Um, but it's, yeah, I, but, I, but, I, but I was very clear, and he himself was very clear as well, this is not a perfect example, this is not a perfect scenario. There were other perspectives, m- multiple perspectives, but I, I think the overall ethics there, and I think it's something that comes from disability activism, is the principle of nothing about us without us that you must include voices of marginalised communities when you're working on their heritage and their issues. So I think that's, yeah, it's it's a nice catchphrase, but the reality will always be complicated. Roma, you have your hand. To continue in a bit uh, of what was said by Gabe, uh, I would add that uh, that working with difficult heritage and communities uh, engaged with this difficult heritage voluntarily or involuntarily uh, opens uh, up most really, really, really fundamental ethical questions when you realize that the heritage these communities work with is not a, an object of their, of their choice. Uh, so the sub- sub- subject agency is somewhat uh, different than in a situation, w- but then in a in a regular situation. So if they are not voluntarily engaged with the heritage, uh, then they are implicated in what happened. So the moment this implication in this difficult past, be it genocide, be it ethnic cleansing, be it, be it any social injustice marginalization or, uh, or or any kind of uh, social problem, when this being revealed, uh, ethical questions, of course, arise and multiply because it seems that everyone we interview, everyone we include into our research, we invite to museums, we co- uh, co-work in uh, uh, present preparing the exhibition actually uh, opens up to the soft spot of the of the community. So uh, whatever will be shared with us can be can be used against the informant. Uh, whatever will be shared with the wider public will turn in it will in turn uh, make the situation of the community uh, more vulnerable. So uh, actually, this 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 moment we realized that we are working with this something that Erica Lerner, um, our colleague uh, from the project on folk, Holocaust folklore, termed uh, implicated communities after Michael Rothberg. I think this opens uh, that this is like clarifies the situation and probably is a useful approach to. Uh, to this ethical dimension of of communities we are exposed to. Thank you. And Kirsty. To unmute first. Uh, I was thinking about uh, the question of memory activists, which also Susanna actually mentioned. And I have been studying actually the Soviet past already over 20 years doing interviews, also oral history interviews. And when I started, the main discourse on the Soviet past was only in the um, discourse of uh, rupture and trauma, and nobody talked about this everyday activists, uh, everyday experiences, sorry. Uh, and uh, then I was uh, I was studying exactly the this, this side of this Soviet heritage, the, 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 you can also name it nostalgia or this uh, everyday experiences. And um, at the, some, some point when I also made a, had an opinion article or have also made public my research, then I also received the um, requests from the people or emails from the people uh, to, to also to bring in also their experiences. To, to advocate the experiences more. And I was just thinking about this role uh, as, as me as a researcher to, to fi- find this balance be, um, of being a researcher and on the other side to, as this area is really very, very complex, I didn't want to stress only the one side on the nostalgic side of that heritage. It is still, it is very diff- also difficult 
heritage in Estonia. So this to find this uh, balance between these um, different roles, and I think also that the museum curators also they if they are also working together with uh, communities very closely as the one of member of our research team is uh, working at the Estonian National Museum and is also working with uh, uh, repressed people from one side and the other side from uh, Russian minorities in Eastern Estonia. And um, she's also taking uh, very much from that community side as um, as the voice of, of, of the, these communities this uh, source communities. So this memory activist is really, I think it's very much uh, bound if we are doing the memory studies, what we are doing actually. And so I think Ola, you are ready to add something? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, when I'm thinking, for example, uh, some of my research, I have researched these kind of collected life writings and reminiscences in the archives. And it's, it's of course, the situation that mm, this kind of material, it's, it's not like pure information, but it, it's really, um, it, it's a kind of a um, certain kind of people want to respond in these calls and, and they want to kind of, um, it, it's a very, um, um, already these people who, who want to, to participate are certain kinds of, of people. And I think that, um, uh, one kind of solution that uh, that researchers um, can make uh, when researching these kinds of uh, kind of um, life writings and, and personal reminiscences is to not to to kind of um, consider this material as pure or as re representing the voice of this group, but but to kind of um, more um, analyze the situations through which these kind of collections are made, what kind of um, actors are involved, what is the kind of role of, of archives and, and to whom these, these calls are published, and then kind of uh, review this material from the perspective of all of these kinds of factors that, that uh, have an effect on, on what kind of uh, memories there are in archives uh, for us to to research for example and i think this is kind of basic source critical thing but it applies to to also various other other kinds of materials and also um, the work we do as researchers when when working with communities or conducting interviews or that that it's impossible to get um kind of a um, pure uh, knowledge or pure data that is uh, free from all kinds of these um, processes of selection, uh, which are, can be quite complicated. Yeah, thank you. Um, I actually had a, a bit of a, if I can use my, my chair privilege, I had a follow-up question um, for Kirsty, just based on uh, what you said in your introduction, I started to say about um, also studying curators and museum professionals as a community. They're not, in a way, then, I mean, they're not a marginalized community usually, and but they're also not a community that's used to being studied. They usually collaborate with study or are doing it themselves. How has that worked? Have there been sort of challenges or anything sort of surprising happened with actually studying this type of group? I was just curious. Yeah, I would say it's uh, it's not an easy topic at all, actually. <laughs> uh, because um, first I have to say that we have wonderful experience with the team of, uh, at the Museum of Occupation and Freedom. I mean, it is also a, a little bit complicated relationship which we have because um, the current uh, manager and the previous manager were actually the former students here at the, our department. So it is also, but also, I mean, also the, the other curators, uh, which are not connected to us as uh, former teachers, uh, they are, have been very, very helpful and, and also very open to our suggestions and were reading our papers and giving feedback. So from that side, this has been a very um, positive experience. But, but um, with other museums, and especially with um, bigger, because the Museum of uh, Occupation is really a tiny one, actually. It's a small museum. 
but we are also working uh, with other museums here. And I would say it's a quite a complicated issue, actually. <laughs> it is uh, because, as you also mentioned, um, uh, the museum curators or museum specialists are very aware of their position. Uh, uh, and actually, um, uh, it is uh, it is not so hard to to get access to them, but uh, it is maybe um, it is uh, maybe that they, they are very aware. They are also reading the same papers we are doing, <laughs> actually. Uh, and maybe I also have um, experience that they are very sensitive uh, to to what's critics actually. Uh, so it it is not an easy issue, I would say. Yeah, I, I think I can relate to that. I, I've had the experiences of uh, sensitivity. I think when trying to write about. Um, Susie, so, you muted yourself. Uh, yeah, I realized that. I thought I'd unmuted, but I hadn't. Sorry. I just want, want to mention yeah. that I found that I think the Trinas and um, who was the co, co representative, I'm looking for the name, Yurid. That, yeah. Uh, that, yeah, that was really interesting to, to listen to their approach. Yeah, so if they also want to bring in something more, <laughs> would be lovely to hear. Okay, yes, um, so I'm unmuted now, good. Um, yes, and, and, and that's a good reminder actually, anybody, um, either presenters from earlier or, or um, audience, please do jump in whenever you, you wish with this. It's, we have a panel, but we also encourage wider discussion uh, in spite of Zoom fatigue. So do, do, um, do join in if you wish. But just to, yeah, I was, I was saying, but I guess nobody could hear me, that, that I can totally relate to uh, what you said about sensitivity with, with this type of sort of heritage professional group that actually it can make it challenging to write critically about them, especially if they are seeing the paper or, or a collaborator, even that it can be difficult maybe to, to comment on, on certain issues. But Ulla, um, your hand is up again. Yes, I, I have a question for Gabriel. Uh, uh, could you could you tell us more about your colleagues' reactions toward your research? You said that that, that they, you received some very negative reactions, and and I found that very interesting. And and I would like to hear more if you could share that. Um, yeah, sure. The, I mean, so the, the field I'm working in primarily here is um, the archaeology of the contemporary era, so the archaeology of twentieth. 21st of centuries and this is a field which is quite I would say quite intellectually dynamic and quite politically radical um, lots of activist research on fields like homelessness um, anti-war activism that, that kind of thing so it's um, it's an interesting field to work in and I enjoy working in it um, so I think yes um, I think the the reaction was um, to the approach that I was taking of working closely with um, drug users to understand the material culture assemblages, the assemblages and the individual artifacts and the stories behind them. Um, and it was uh, two of the colleagues who we circulated a, a draft of the Paper two. This is a paper co-authored with a, a drug user activist. Um, one who had, I think, um, members of their family who've been adversely affected by uh, drug use, who was not comfortable with um, seeing uh, drug users as a marginalised community, um, rather than as a yeah, I, I wouldn't want to put words into this person's mouth, but it, it, they were struggling, struggling to humanise. And I think it, it, um, they were reasonably honest that it was their own issues they were dealing with there. The other one was somebody who, um, again, who, who, who I was surprised based on their work, they were not more receptive 
to this. And they felt that it was wrong of us not to be more um, judgmental of people who use drugs and not to include in the research some kind of advocacy against using drugs, which I feel missed the point of the work completely. But these one, this was people who, who is, I, I, they had not mis mis misunderstood the research in any way. They had not um, ignored parts of it. They, they simply had very strong political and or personal opposition to the approach that we were taking. And the approach was working in collaboration with, with representatives of a marginalized community. So I think, it, and, and I was surprised about at how surprised I was, if you see what I mean, I had, I had expected resistance to this work, but not from these people. And it, it made me feel that this work is, was, was more dangerous, professionally dangerous than I had realized. It, it, was, it was a negative experience for me and for my relationship with those colleagues. I think that's a really, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say thank you. I think that's it's really, I think it's really valuable for us to hear how challenging that has been in in unexpected ways, um, and to to add that to all of the different things that we've been thinking about. Um, I know Susie, you wanted to say something, but we have we have a question in the chat. Or yes, that's what I was going to. <laughs> Magda has just put a cue in the chat to indicate that she'd like to ask a question, and then there is a comment comment from Robert. Yes. Afterwards, so Robert, I don't know if you wanted to write a question into the chat, which we can then talk about after we've talked about Magda's question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the wonderful panel. It's uh, really interesting. And I have a question about uh, rule breakers in our research on difficult heritage. Um, and I suppose it might be to Gabe and Roma, but um, yes, anyone can answer because I'm struggling with that as well. So. In the case of difficult heritage, I think it is really the non-humans and the environments that the environment that are the prime rule breakers. So I'm thinking about the non-commemorated sites that are overgrown, um, populated with plants and animals, uh, and the landscape that makes heritage visible. So kind of the soil that pops up, the syringes and the archaeological assemblages. Um, so yes, yeah, so what what are the approaches and methodologies of working with non-human rule breakers beyond storytelling? That's my question. So perhaps I will uh, answer straight Sean. So there is a recent development in something that is called uh, environmental Holocaust studies or environmental Holocaust history. It is a proposition actually developed in Poland by a scholar that works in Stanford and Poland, Ewa Domańska, with her, with her students, uh, Jacek Małczyński, for instance, who wrote extensively and also in English on the, on the agency of trees, on the agency of soil recently, uh, and how these uh, these subjects can be meaningful, can can have a role in uh, in thinking about the past. So uh, there will be like a structured school. I think there is uh, there is a there is a set of texts already available in the uh, in the journal of uh, genocide research. So so there is much more to read, and this approach is definitely ongoing. Uh, another scholar uh, from Poland, Mikołaj Smykowski, is proposing treating the, the, the greenery, the, 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 the nature at the, uh, the genocide sites as an ecological museum, as a form of commemoration. And this approach is definitely also among us, and this is not necessarily uh, something surprising. I think that many, uh, many uh, local communities already has treated these sites as a specific forms of commemoration known to them and understood by them as a forms of commemoration. So it's like reading the, the grassroots practices and making them, uh, bringing them into, into more general practices. So definitely this is something that develops and also forensic turn and material turns. These two turns allow us to look closer at, at these objects and consider them agents. 
So forensic and, and new archaeology, actually, this non, uh, especially this this archaeology, the, the, the schools of archaeology that tries not to disturb the land. So non-invasive archaeologies are also useful in approaching these uh, these new new witnesses, new new partners in speaking about difficult past. So, so yeah, the, the the new school is coming, and it's absolutely thrilling what's going on. Thank you for the question. Hey, I think Gabe is also ready to respond to that, and then and then we can actually go to Robert to ask his question. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I think this idea of nature um, as agent in this scenario is a really powerful one. And one of the things that I've looked at is the issue of ruins as memorials, whether as official memorials or vernacular memorials. And the fact that ruins become overgrown, they get covered in weeds and then, then grass, and eventually they don't look like ruins anymore. And the, this is does not always match the narrative of commemoration which the communities wish for. So one of the things that, that I've looked at, which I find fascinating, is um, where ruins are carefully preserved to look as ruined as possible. To, to look painful as a way of displaying wounds. And I, I found a simile in the medieval beggars who would rip their, their scabs off their wounds so that they would look more bleeding, they would look more ill, they would look more pitiful. So, I th I th so it's interesting that, that there are people who want, they, people understand in, 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 instinctively the need to have ruins that look painful. Orador sur Glan in France, the village that was murdered um, by the by the Nazis and burned, um, they 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 have a preservation plan which states it must be preserved in the best possible state of ruin. So it must be collapsing, but not too collapsing. It, there must be weeds, but not too much. It must look miserable. And this is a very man manipulative way of working with heritage, but it's also a very understandable one, that this language of ruins is one that we instinctively understand. And the language of plants that go over these things, we understand instinctively as healing. But sometimes healing is not culturally desirable or socially acceptable. And that's very interesting. Thank you. I think that's the really, really important point for, for many of the things we've been thinking about. Uh, Robert, do you wanted to pose your question yourself? Please go. Well, first of all, thank you for a uh, extremely provocative and, and exciting uh, session. I'm dealing with, with a number of tough issues. What, what Gabriel says just said, I think, um, embodies you know my question about the uh, projection and the, 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 the uh, biases that, that any researcher practitioner brings into the uh, transaction and the interaction with research subjects or, or the you know the heritage field um, you know as a cultural broker or as a researcher there's an interplay of interest the the, um, uh, the, the, the the researcher the practitioner has the institutional interests of their, their work for a heritage uh, uh, entity institution they have their ideological biases and there's also a power symmetry. Between the um, between the research and the practitioner, so I was wondering the thoughts the thoughts uh, among the panelists about um, uh, positionalism. This is a, a topic that interests me a great deal. I just um, about to publish something on cultural brokerage, and there's a tradition in anthropology uh, tr or the transactionalist school deals with this interplay of of interest, and it's something that that uh, I think also has um, risen to the fore with writing culture co-production reflection of the role of the ethnographer. So uh, uh, thoughts about this, about the positionality. Benjamina, would you like to respond first? Yeah, yeah, I find that very interesting. Thank you so much, uh, Robert, for that question. Um, and reflect on my own uh, sort of positionality um, so I mentioned before that uh, that I am a can, and um, within this sort of linguistic group, there are many uh, um, sort of subgroups, so to speak. And I think for me, having people challenging me 
um, people that I trust, people uh, that I respect and, you know, where the relationship is also sort of uh, vice versa. That is very helpful in, in challenging uh, my own knowledge so that I don't sort of, in my own work, I don't fall in the trap of uh, sort of um, embodying the knowledge I'm trying to uh, pursue or sort of um, using some of my, my own knowledge of the cultural space that I occupy as the knowledge, right? Um, having people challenge that is very helpful um, because, you know, I can, that history is sort of mine, you know, and I, I feel that there's a degree of authority that can speak to that. Uh, but my, my sense of, of that history is not, you know, universal or by no means sort of homogeneous with, with the people, with other people's uh, perceptions. Um, so the way I deal with positionality to sort of answer your question is um, I'm open and I'm looking, actively looking for uh, people to challenge me on that. Thank you. To uh, Ula, would you like to go next? Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, for me, I think uh, the kind of um, uh, basic principle from where to start from is that uh, we have to be very self-critical um, and, and, and we have to kind of um, evaluate our disciplinary kind of uh, position and, and our disciplinary traditions and also the kind of um, uh, what we are interested in, in uh, and also evaluate them from the perspective of the research participants or our partners. And, and it's not, of course, a, a, uh, an easy task because sometimes the research participants' idea of the kind of um, research and what is what comes out from my work might be really different than my idea. And it's sometimes it, it's very difficult to kind of communicate uh, <laughs> my own kind of work. And, and it's, it's sometimes really difficult to even know what is the kind of end product and, and how it turns out to be. And, and so it's, it's, Sometimes I, I feel that it's it's very difficult to keep the research participants informed because even I necessarily do not know how this will end up. But I think that the only solution is to be really self-reflexive and, and really self-critical and kind of um, be open about all of these kinds of things. And, and of course, we always have to balance um, between the issues that also Kirsti brought up, that sometimes communicating um, something that we we come up with is is, is really difficult and and might be in some cases also um, impossible thing to do in order to kind of uh, respect our research partners and 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 their their kind of will. Thank you. Would any of the other panelists like to respond? If not, we can we can move to another question. Um, if anybody else in the audience has a question, please feel free either to use the raise hand function or to write the question into the chat um, and we can ask it for you. Um, in the meantime, I was wondering, and this is a, a relatively spontaneous question and thought of mine, um, as we've been discussing these challenges, not only um, the challenges of the topics that we research and work on, but also the some of the challenges for ourselves and for the people that we work with or um, who are implicated in the research that we are undertaking, to think about um, the, the ways in which the, the challenge of trying to break the rules, particularly in working interdisciplinary or across disciplines, um, and work in new ways on difficult heritage, um, how different that is for um, those of us in secure academic or professional positions compared to those in precarious um, employment and what that might mean. Um, you know, I think, you know, some areas are much more willing 
to have interdisciplinary research than others and how the gatekeeping perhaps within academia um, influences the choices that people are able to make around how they do their work um, from a precarious position uh, right up into um, more secure employment. So if anybody, if any of you have any thoughts or other questions related to those things, it would be great to hear them as well. And I think, Susanna, I, I would just like to also add the sort of seniority aspect to that. So, you know, being early career academic or uh, also more established, uh, you know, whether you are sort of working in a precarious uh, employment um, condition or more established. Um, so that's also interesting. I think that's a really good question, Susanna, and I, I suppose people are gathering their thoughts on how to respond to that. And it's definitely an issue. And, and I've certainly come across people that have been discouraged from doing particular topics because they've been told it won't help them develop their careers if they go down that particular path. So I think academia does guide people away. Or, and I think funding is also a part of that, of picking things that are attractive, that will get funding and therefore enhance your career there's lots of uh, deciders that we perhaps don't even think about a lot of the time that actually really influences what we choose to research yeah absolutely I mean I think perhaps to frame it in a more positive way because I, I guess my comment in some ways was quite negative but um, you know what can we do either as individually or within our professional and academic roles to um, to encourage greater interdisciplinarity, what can we do to break some of these rules and these established patterns of working? How can we encourage um, more diverse, more kind of crossover, more integration of junior and senior colleagues in different roles on the same, you know, on, on the same kind of level of respect? How can we how can we manage all of that? Does anybody have ideas or um, ideas to take forward or examples that they've seen that have worked really well. Um, <laughs> so I haven't seen any good examples, <laughs> so let me put it out there. Um, but I was just thinking, I was just thinking the way and this is me speaking from a UK perspective. Um, of course, you know, we are um, all speaking from, from different um, locations and different systems. But um, I often think that the way we, uh, we approach, uh, the way we quantify research is actually not fit for purpose. Um, in the sense of, you know, especially if you're, if you're working for, for, you know, for an institution such as a university, you know, there is a certain pace of publication you have to keep up with, uh, funding that you are bringing to the uh, institution. Uh, and, you know, obviously you have the, the ref that, you know, is keeping track of what you are doing. And, and so if you're an earlier uh, career uh, researcher or academic, you know, there's so much that you can aspire to um, if you are wanting to engage uh, with specific uh, research, uh, I mean, Gabriel was was mentioning. Uh, Gabriel, you mentioned your experience with the research that you 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 worked on, uh, and I'm uh, thinking, you know, what does that do to the next research you would want to pursue? Um, right, and, and sorry to put you on the spot. I'm just thinking about that because you mentioned it. Um, and so, yeah, so it's not that the things we are aspiring to do uh, are not supported by the structures that we have in place. And so, you know, I don't have an answer <laughs> for your question, um, but these are just my, my thoughts from where I'm sitting. Yeah, I think they're really good uh, reflections. Uh, maybe we can go fuller than Gabe or, or Gabe, is it a direct response? It's better for you to go first. Okay, Ulla then, over to you. Yes, thank you. That's a really big question and, and I think really important question. And, and I was thinking that perhaps we should be more aware of also the kind of um, 
language of excellence that is uh, kind of very much uh, uh, come into academia. So, so there are kind of um, uh, researchers are valued based on their excellence and the excellence of their ideas. And perhaps we should uh, more uh, kind of uh, instead of thinking ourselves or or the senior researchers or the uh, who kind of are in 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 permanent positions as rather than seeing them as excellent or or talented or something, maybe just uh, also considering them as as uh, uh, lucky ones or or perhaps privileged ones, and also seeing that that um, often when the kind of um, attention goes into this one excellent researcher, there is a big group of researchers around her or him and, and who are um, kind of um, participating in this research. And, and, and research rarely is a is an kind of um, activity of one um, genius brain, but it involves a lot of people and, and, and maybe just also giving credit to all of these people who... Um, are involved in this process, but I, uh, I myself find it really kind of a um, um, difficult of how to kind of react this um, excellence um, discourse that is around these funding instruments and and, and governments who kind of uh, um, decide what kind of research they want to fund. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. It's really uh, tricky, and obviously, there's, there's also balancing with that. Um, some there needs to be some way of deciding, otherwise, people could research something really strange that maybe isn't helpful for anyone. So that so it's yeah, but it's hard to get the the balance, I guess. Um, we have several and and just ten minutes, so we'll just continue. Gabe, would you like to go next? Yes, but but I'll be quick. Um, just following up on this on this idea of of um, early career people doing risky research. One of the things that, that interests me is the emergence of um, quite radical research methodologies for working with uh, uh, communities, thinking of things like participatory action research, um, which are grounded in the idea of building relationships with communities, working with communities uh, in, a, in a very reciprocal way to build research questions, to build research agendas that meet match the need of the community as much as the need of the, of the researcher and how most funding streams anywhere in the world do not work for research like that so i would say well one of the res responsibilities for those of us who are in more s secure positions of employment in more advanced stages of our career is to try to work to create spaces and opportunities for people who want to, to de develop careful gradual ethical relationships with communities and, and build research projects that might take years to get to the point of even having a research question. We need to find ways to structurally support that work because that, that is the most ethical, that is the most cautious, that's the, the future, this kind of work. Yeah, thank you. And that actually uh, relates to uh, Katie Borland's keynote yesterday talking about slow research and slow science and trying to get back to that. But Kirsty, I'd hand to you. Yeah, thank you very much. I think, Susanna, it's a really important question, and I think it should be discussed widely in the CF also. And I think also, but I think also the one example is also our panel here that we, we discussed these different questions and, and obstacles which we have. I was just thinking that, yeah, I'm, as Ulla put it, I'm at the moment, I'm the lucky one. We just uh, started <laughs> the new research project. And what I hope that what, what we can do during that project is that really to do a collaborative research in this sense that we really want to bring together the source community and museum creators, uh, us as researchers, and also then artists to, to make uh, um, some difference or, or, or to be also the equal partners. I mean, I know it uh, sounds a little bit idealistic, but uh, at least it is one of our goals to do during that project. So thank you for all these questions and topics. And Roma. 
Thank you, Susanna, for this uh, empathetic question. And uh, in the spirit of the colonial thinking, I would like to mention one more group of precarious scholars that we probably all have ch had chance to work with. I mean vernacular historians or uh, grassroots scholars that can sometimes spend a whole life in archives and uh, sometimes they produce quite a lot. Sometimes they are published in 30 uh, copies. Sometimes they are never published. However, they have done incredible, uh, incredible groundwork. So in the, in the spirit of the, the end of epistemological north, I would say that the non-geographical cells that uh, Santos is claiming, is, uh, this is everywhere around us. So there are scholars unacknowledged for their, for, for their expertise uh, because of our <clears throat> predilections and our uh, standpoints born in within this epistemolo epistemology of the North. So I think as, as sensitive scholars, as scholars working with difficult heritage, we are especially called for acknowledging these, the scholarship that is born in a struggle against some rules and against some imposed norms of stronger groups in society. So I think there is still much to acknowledge and there's, uh, there are different levels of precar precarity and vulnerability within uh, around us around uh, uh, around our scholar colleagues and and as those who work with this frontier all the time we are pro probably those who who should constantly ask this question how to acknowledge different different approaches to to knowledge different uh, circulations of knowledges thank you muted again there we go so um I'm not muted, am I? It just told me I am. No, okay. Yes, thank you very much, all of you. Um, I think we've had a really fruitful discussion and I'm, I'm very grateful also to the audience that have stuck with us for this. It's really wonderful. Um, one rule that we're not going to break is timing because especially in, in Zoom time, time away from the screen is, is incredibly precious and incredibly important. So I'm really happy also that we're finishing on time today. Uh, thank you for the questions from the floor as well as for all the discussants. I think you've brought your, your experience and your knowledge um, in, in, in really wonderful ways. So uh, we're both very, very grateful to you for that. Um, I'm going to hand over to Susanna for the very final word, but just as in my local uh, committee um, capacity, just to remind that there is this music and, and other wonderful things later on today as well, but make sure you've poured yourself something nice and cold by then to enjoy with it. So Susanna, I'll to you. Thank you, Susie. I know normally you're meant to say something quite profound at the end, and I, I, I think we, I've almost run out of any ideas of saying anything clever at all, but other than to say um, how much I appreciate the engagement and the deep thinking that has really gone into all of the comments, questions, discussions, presentations today. Um, I'm sure, you know, for me and I'm sure for the rest of you, there are so many things to think about afterwards, so many complex issues that really demand much more time, much more attention. Um, and as we've kind of discussed, thinking from different perspectives, reflection from different approaches, different voices, different um, different ways of seeing um, in order to help us all to, to understand better and to think differently. Um, and I really appreciate how much each of you has engaged with um, today in order to, to offer that opportunity to all of us who've been here. So thank you all so much. Um, and yes, uh, many more, th much more thinking to do, I think, for all of us. Um, so thank you very much overall and um, enjoy your evenings. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you.